Hello and welcome to uh, Marcellus' uh, first quarter web, uh, webinar. Uh, we'll talk about three things today. Uh, first is the performance uh, so far, YTD, and particularly given the meltdown in the markets. And then uh, I have my colleagues, Sarah Mukherjee, talking about how he sees the macroeconomic scenario and what it means uh, for RPMS. And then uh, we'll have uh, Rakshit, the fund manager, talk about uh, page industries, which has been the content of the latest newsletters. And after which, we'll open it up for uh, Q&A. So I request Rakshit to talk about the performance. Sure. Thanks, Ramon. Uh, hi. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, let me just uh, figure out how to change the slide. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So uh, on the slide in front of you, you can see this chart showing the performance of our uh, consistent compounders, PMS at Marcellus. Uh, uh, most importantly, for the month of uh, July, you'll notice actually the uh, best uh, part of outperformance that has happened since inception happened in just the last one month, uh, which is also not a surprise. Uh, uh, if you've read our books, uh, in our books, Topic and Investing on Unusual Billionaires, as well as in our in our previous newsletters and blogs, we keep talking about the fact that uh, the philosophy that we have, uh, uh, besides just delivering a healthy return to our uh, our uh, uh, clients over a longer period of time, it also intends to minimize the risk involved. And uh, the only way that it uh, does the risk minimization is by uh, avoiding uh, loss to capital during uh, uh, periods of market stress, or I, I would say reducing the loss to capital during periods of market stress, uh, especially compared to the broader benchmarks. And that's what we've seen. We've delivered a, a minus 1.5% in the month of July versus minus 57 And if you include the five days we've had in August so far, uh, it's been uh, it's been roughly uh, 500 bips of 600 bips of outperformance since inception. So that's uh, that's where we stand. Um, uh, sort of, do you want to add something? So, so, so look, I'm, um, I'm a happy client. Um, um, that performance since inception on 1st December, in a way, refers to uh, uh, early clients like me who joined Marcellus's PMS, who invested in Marcellus's PMS early on, uh, who invested in Marcellus's PMS early on. Um, and, and I also take a lot of uh, heart from the fact that the market's weak because that's suggesting to me uh, I should put more money in, which is what I'm planning to do. I've already invested a fair bit of my net worth in Marcellus's PMS, and I'm planning to put more money in. But let me let me discuss the broader context as to what's happening in our country, why our markets are getting banged up like this, and you know what could what could happen in the next three or four months. When we spoke a month ago, we had highlighted that we expected cost of capital to rise in our country. Uh, it's happened. It will happen further. Uh, note that we're not referring to the RBI repo rate. The RBI repo rate has fallen. I think it will fall further. What we're referring to, uh, to cost of capital is for a typical small or mid corporate, what is the cost of borrowing? That number is going up. The risk premium is going up. Uh, funds are becoming scarcer for small businesses to access. And that journey we reckon continues as the stress in the NBFC sector continues. Uh, um, uh, mutual funds become that much more reluctant to lend to extend funds to NBFCs. Banks become reluctant to extend funds to NBFCs, um, and that in turn feeds through into uh, a weak credit dispersal by NBFCs to the real economy, which in turn obviously not just hits the cost of capital, also leads to economic growth uh, being low and low and slow. A month ago, when we spoke to you guys. We were saying that the one thing we thought would happen, which hadn't yet happened, was the currency breaking. Uh, our reckoning was over a 12-month period, the rupee would be at around mid 70s to the mid 70s to the dollar, 75, 76 to the dollar. A month ago, on the back of election euphoria, foreign money had come in and that was holding the currency up. But as I think everybody on the call probably knows by now, that foreign money has uh, long since departed. And the currency, therefore, is sinking as expected. And as I was saying a month ago, and I was saying two months ago as well, three months ago, I think the rupee will gradually move towards uh, towards mid-70s to the dollar, which obviously makes it that much harder for Indian companies to borrow abroad because you're borrowing uh, uh, with, the rupee, uh, with the currency, which is weakening gradually. Um, obviously, all of this is not good news for uh, the typical small cap, mid cap, 
uh, uh, you know fund or pms or ei whatever be that it may because if you got if you're in a rising cost of money climate small and mid caps tend to tend to uh, tend to come out looking pretty banged up uh, i think there's two more specific things i'll highlight i reckon there'll be more accounting frauds that will come up in the next 2 3 months so the year ending accounting the year ending accounts haven't yet been signed off for many listed entities and the, the dodgiest listed entities haven't managed to get the year ending account signed off because the auditors are refusing to do so so i reckon there'll be more accounting frauds that will come to light in the next 60 days or so the dodgiest companies the, the most wretched listed entities in our countries tend to get their accounts signed off as late as december january so so the sort of you know hall of infamy in indian audit uh, uh, i think will ha- has a long way to go um i think it's also realistic uh, basis the the work that i do in various regulatory contexts i think it's also realistic to expect um at least one prominent nbfc slash hfc and at least one you know reasonably sizable bank to have uh, existential existential issues in the next uh, 90 days or so um and you know you the, the, the backdrop to the nbfc hfc crisis is well known ilfs and all that but i reckon g- given the lie of the land one prominent nbfc prominent private sector bank getting into trouble is uh, is should be par for the course in the next 90 days or so right and the final piece which i think is significant for lots of people on this call is the new is the new pms rules as uh, some of you might know on friday last friday that is uh, sebi uh, put up a new consultation paper a work a new consultation paper on uh, on pms rules uh, a working group uh, uh, constituted by put together by sebi had has published has put this paper together uh, in the interest of full disclosure i'm part of the working group uh, and as you might have read in the press this consultation paper from sebi is saying that the minimum ticket size for having a pms goes up from 25 lakhs to 50 lakhs just to be clear it's not gone up yet it's even now 25 lakhs but if this pms consultation paper comes comes through as policy which is which is what i think the working expectation is then 50 lakhs will be the new normal for opening a pms account the consultation paper does say that those who open a pms account as per the current regime will be allowed to have a ticket size below 50 lakhs but once the new regime kicks in the new minimum will be 50 lakhs so so if you haven't yet uh, opened a pms account whether it's with us or anybody else is really your prerogative if you haven't yet opened a pms account just keep in mind that once the rules change it's likely the new minimum will be 50 lakhs the second thing that the consultation paper does highlight is it's mooted it's proposed in the consultation paper that the net worth criteria for running a pms Uh, for for a group like us for instance will go up to minimum net worth will become 5 crores at the moment it's 2 crores it's proposed that it becomes 5 crores i reckon lots of pmss will struggle with that number and therefore over the next 12 months or so i think there will be some pmss who might have to uh, just wind up their shutters next 12 months 18 months they might have to wind up their shutters if they are unable to get their net worth up from um 2 crores to 5 crores so quite a significant paper uh, uh, uh by reading as a industry participant is that the pms consultation paper that sebi has published will lead to a shake out in the pms space there will be fewer providers and and as as we were discussing 50 rather than 25 lakhs would be the criteria if you therefore want to open a pms with a small commitment 25 lakhs or so you need to do it before the new rules kick in it's not yet guaranteed that 50 lakhs will be the number but there is a possibility that that will happen if you want to mitigate against that opening a pms account quicker uh, sooner rather than later would make sense so that's it for me i'll hand over back to rakshit sure <clears throat> so uh that's uh that's what we have done versus what the market is uh, is is delivering uh the next chart that you can see on your screen is the one on the right is about the stocks that we hold in our portfolio so we have a portfolio of 12 stocks uh those 12 stocks have delivered since inception which is since 1st of december 2018 the return which you can see in the chart on your right hand side of the screen uh two main points to note here one the market overall nifty overall 
as you can see since inception has delivered 0.7 percent uh we've uh, we've had 10 out of the 12 stocks that we have in the portfolio uh, delivering more than nifty uh more importantly uh, five out of actually four out of uh, four out of these 10 have even delivered more than 15 percent which i think is a is a comfortable zone uh, 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 over a longer term for annualized returns so on and so forth so in that context obviously 10 out of 12 stocks beating nifty uh, is a is a good achievement uh, however uh, there are two stocks which are in the negative uh, stock 11 is itc and stock 12 is page industries uh, in particular page industries is also one of the larger allocations uh, in our pms and it has delivered uh, minus 32 percent as a share price uh, since uh, 1st of december which has obviously had a drag on the performance uh, that we've uh, we've delivered for our clients in the PMS. So um, it's it's very uh, very justified as a result to expect, and hence we've been uh, receiving several questions uh, around Page Industries around why we continue to hold it uh, despite the fact that last couple of quarters have been uh, weak on the fundamental side, uh, uh, but our uh, allocation to page industries in the model portfolio and hence our clients portfolio has not fallen um, and hence uh, we published a newsletter a few days back uh, uh, explaining why we continue to hold page and uh, uh, i'll spend the next few slides and maybe the next 10 minutes uh, summarizing our view on page uh, and thereafter we can uh, we can probably have a uh, have a q a session uh, uh, on anything related to page or even outside of page but related to our portfolio um, so this is this is the slide where uh, uh, before i get into page itself uh, let me just give you our views on the product characteristics uh, of the industry in which page operates so this is a company which sells jockey as uh, as the predominant part of its overall uh, uh, products uh, and uh, it derives two thirds of its overall revenue from innerwear, one third from outerwear, and in particular for innerwear, all these characteristics that you see in front of your screen apply. To begin with, the product is more utility oriented, right? Uh, especially what paid sells is more utility oriented. It's regarding all day comfort. Uh, page doesn't do the fashion oriented products it doesn't do luxury oriented products even when it comes to let's say women's in a way when it comes to let's say bras page doesn't do the strapless types the uh, uh, the, the the sort of uh, uh, fashionable uh, bras that some of the uh, competitors like triumph or like nmo might be doing um, and hence uh, pretty much the entire product portfolio of page is around utility utility being comfort for the customer so that's one aspect of the product characteristic uh, just bear that in mind the second aspect is loyalty now here i'll give you a couple of extreme uh, extreme examples for consumption and then uh, maybe that will help understand where pages products sit so on the one hand you can have uh, let's say soaps and detergents as consumables where uh, you do get bored very quickly uh, uh, by consuming the same brand, the same product, the same fragrance, uh, month after month after month. As a result, uh, there is a very high degree of uh, experimentation involved in consumer behavior when it comes to soaps, detergents, face washes, uh, moisturizers, even I would say outerwear like shirts, trousers, uh, to a certain extent even footwear. Uh, you do not want your whole, uh, 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 let's say, toilet cabinet or your wardrobe or your whole household to be full of the same brand uh, uh, for several years in a row. As a result, uh, even if the product delivers on the utility aspect, uh, experimentation itself means that the loyalty related to uh, consumer behavior is relatively a lower component of decision making. Um, However, let me give you the other extreme bit, which is, let's say, if you look at uh, Nestle's Maggi noodles, if you look at, let's say, Nestle's formula milk. Now, these are products where the stickiness, the loyalty of the consumer, once he sees the utility being delivered upon, 
is very very high uh, you would not see experimentation in these categories and the customer won't mind consuming the same brand the same taste of product for decades on end right uh, to a large extent i think the uh, the bulk of the uh, the the population in the country which is a fan of maggi noodles has consumed only the same masala maggi uh, for the last uh, 10 20 30 years of their life uh, uh, lifetimes right so uh, with these two as the extremes uh, jockeys uh, presence in innerwear especially utility fashion sorry utility comfort oriented uh, products is more closer to i would say the nestle's uh, product equivalent in terms of loyalty than to a Unilever's product equivalent in terms of loyalty um, and hence customers don't like to shop around right once especially once they've finalized the fabric fit the brand etc um, it's also quite important to note here that because most uh, 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 retail uh, points of sale uh, where the customer goes to buy an underwear uh, they don't have a trial room as a result, the incentive to experiment is even lower, right? Uh, because you don't want once you've got the fit going for you, you don't want to just randomly pick up something from the shelf, bring it back home, and then realize that it didn't uh, it didn't uh, uh, deliver the comfort to you uh, uh, without the trial room being available at the time of shopping, right? Uh, the third aspect is the manufacturing part, where textile alongside footwear, I think these two are the two most labor-intensive industries in the country. Um, and hence, uh, if you uh, do in-house labor workforce, then obviously the challenge becomes uh, uh, managing high level of attrition rates in this labor workforce. And hence, uh, it, it is, it is all, as a result, a very common practice to outsource manufacturing. Um, so that's, that's also something uh, worth bearing in mind. And the last point being distribution, which is a lot more unorganized retail rather than organized retail. So the mom and pop stores, the hosiery stores still form around 70% of revenues for page. They form around 90% of revenues for the industry, right? And the pantaloons, the large format stores, the exclusive brand outlets are still a minority, a very small minority, right? Now just bear in mind these four aspects and also combined with that, what page offers. So what you can see at the bottom half of the screen in front of you, is that page offers four things one it differentiates the product right so this is not like a unilever soap where there's no product differentiation really compared to say a, a godrej consumer soap yeah uh, here the product is clearly differentiated around comfort and durability the price point is a lot more affordable than what competition offers especially if you compare let's say fruit of the loom hanes benetton um, all of these products which are similar in quality to page uh, uh, to jockeys, their price points are at least 20, 30, 40 percent higher than jockeys. The third aspect is uh, this is a brand which has maintained its aspirational connect for the last 25 years quite successfully. That to maintaining an international international brand recall, because uh, there are several examples like let's say a Bata, right, which is an MNC brand once upon a time was aspirational as well, but through the generations it uh, failed to hold on to its aspiration. Titan and watches has also faced the same uh, challenge. Uh, and there are numerous other examples where you had an MNC brand, which offers not just utility, but also an aspirational uh, brand recall. But then uh, through the generations or over a period of two or three decades, the brand uh, loses its sheen. It fails to remain aspirational as the consumer upgrades himself uh, to a slightly better lifestyle. The brand is 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 not uh, every brand is not good enough to uh, uh, stay up to date with the consumer's uh, aspirations. And the last part which page offers is widespread distribution, because remember, if you've got a loyalty oriented product where shop shopping around is not uh, the preferred uh, 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 component of consumption. And if you've got uh, uh, if you've got utility oriented product where comfort is most important. And hence, uh, once you've defined the utility, as long as it, the product is meeting the utility, you don't need to actually change uh, uh, the product. If you've got that characteristic, all you need is every time you want to uh, replenish your wardrobe with new innerwares, uh, it should be readily available at the nearest point of sale. Right. What that means is the same SKU that you narrowed down on should be available three years out as well, six years out as well. Uh, it might be available in a different color, 
but it has to be available in the same shape in the same style in the same fit perhaps with the same fabric as well uh, and the customer will love to just uh, go and shop for the same product right that's that's the characteristic here and page as a result when it offers widespread distribution it delivers on this aspect of availability of the chosen uh, sku for the customer uh, quite readily so that's that's the backdrop uh, as a result if you see what page delivers versus what its peers deliver now this is quite interesting to observe uh, uh, peers in this case i'm considering uh, the rupas vips uh, uh, lovable lingerie dollar lux in the economy segment and in the premium segment the benettons and the fruit of the looms and hanes of the world uh, what you would see is uh, the differentiation to begin with is on the product portfolio itself uh, page has chosen to go wide nobody else has chosen to go wide they are all uh, uh, sector specific uh, uh, the second differentiation is when it comes to men's in a way it is uh, a little more difficult to deliver comfort in lowers than in uppers right so something called ganji uh, when it gets sold to any consumer there is actually no comfort that you have to deliver in a ganji right uh, uh, you don't need skin uh, tight fit and this and that but when it comes to lowers in men's wear uh, there is some r and d required you need to take care of the physiques of the country you can't just replicate whatever gets sold abroad uh, so you have to indigenize the design and hence uh, 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 it becomes a little difficult to deliver the lower part of men's wear compared to uppers uh, rupa uh, Uh, just to give you a sense rupa sells 80% of their revenue via ganji right 75 to 80% of whatever rupa sells is ganji whereas when you look at jockeys menswear 75% of whatever jockey sells is lower right only 25% is vests right so so uh, that's uh, also something which differentiates uh, jockey from the rest when it comes to women's wear again the the comp- competitor names that might come to mind would be triumph and amor etc lovable lingerie etc these brands have oriented their product portfolio more towards fashion jockey's product portfolio is oriented more towards all day comfort right uh, between the two all day comfort is more difficult to deliver upon because obviously uh, uh, the the product element uh, in terms of design in terms of again Uh, R and D stuff. Uh, the uh, amount of effort that is involved here is much higher. As a result, once you want to do differentiated product, right? Once you want to do differentiated product, you cannot have outsourced manufacturing. Why? Because there is nobody else, especially when you look at jockey, right? Uh, for the last twenty years, jockey has been delivering to the customer something which nobody else delivered in this segment in a scalable manner. as a result you don't have trained workforce available in contractual labor right in the form of contractual labor you won't have trained workforce which can do a uh, uh, comfort oriented differentiated product for the indian indian physique right indian uh, 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 indian climate etc because contractual labor has only been used to manufacturing the rupees of the world ka 100 rupees or 50 rupees wala a uh, relatively less quality uh, in a way right as a result outsourced manufacturing is not the solution at all also because if you train the outsourced laborer right then he will certainly not stick around outsourced manufacturing has a very high degree of attrition so page has decided to go in house others have continued to be outsourced uh, those who offer premium in a way they procure it from bangladesh from sri lanka but then the one manufactured in bangladesh or sri lanka is uh, as per the physics as per the climate of the western world and hence again in a scalable manner cannot be brought to india and and sold to indian customers uh, very easily um, when it comes to doing in house manufacturing the challenge is because this is labor intensive just to give you a sense to sell 2 uh, and a half to 3000 crores worth of uh, 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 products jockey employs around 21000 22000 big workforce of laborers already right and if we are correct in believing that jockey is a very small part of the overall i would say 
40000 crore is just male men and women inner wear category add to it kids wear add to it leisure wear if you are talking about a 1 lakh crore category size and if jockey has to target a bigger share of the 1 lakh crore category size in future right then uh, 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 you can imagine how big a labor workforce jockey would be employing uh, uh, in its factories if it does in house uh, manufacturing now this brings with it lots of risks the first and the biggest one is attrition of trained <coughs> attrition of trained labor workforce jockey is able to deliver around 12 13% attrition rates compared to industry standards of 100 120 130% attrition right the second challenge is uh, 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 ensuring that the labor workforce remains trained retained and incentivized so that you keep deriving efficiencies uh, out of the volume per unit labor workforce employed by you Uh, right so that's that's quite uh, quite difficult and and hence uh, doing in house manufacturing is the is the difficult route which others haven't adopted uh, jockey has and executed successfully um, they can also be by the way they can also be labor strikes and so on and so forth uh, uh, things to manage when it comes to the distribution model this is an easy one to understand you can either be wholesale oriented who are not exclusive to the product or you can be distributor oriented which are exclusive distributors or ebos exclusive uh, brand outlets right if you want the exclusive model it is hard to build it can't be built overnight you can't throw money at a distributor and incentivize him to uh, 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 stick to your product forever right he might test it out for one or two quarters but thereafter not necessary that you will be able to make him stick to yourself uh, whereas the wholesaler Uh, uh, uh is an ad hoc uh, ad hoc channel in terms of whenever you want to throw the product at them with a relatively lower margin they'll happily take it because they won't listen to the terms and conditions that the manufacturer asks them to work with the wholesaler can sell at whatever price he wants to the hosiery store in whatever distribution manner that he wants right jockey cannot dictate terms to a wholesaler really uh, and obviously jockey cannot even get the end last mile feedback on which retailer is selling what product if they if jockey sells via the wholesaler model whereas doing the distributor model is tough but more rewarding that's what jockey has chosen right when it comes to the brand recall we can all relate to this uh, i mean amul macho and uh, whatever uh, dollar and this and that they've all got indian uh, 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 celebrities as brand ambassadors which costs a hell of a lot of money because uh, if you see the advertising spends 12 13 14% of sales is what uh, most uh, most such companies pay uh, jockey has actually managed uh, barely 4 4 and 5% in the next slide you'll see that chart uh, not only that by doing that they've maintained an international brand recall by appointing caucasian models uh, which are obviously much cheaper than celebrities uh, uh, and uh, and by not losing the sheen of the brand uh, so yeah so that's the last point caucasian models versus indian celebrities right so that's that's a simple snapshot of how jockey differentiates in whatever they do compared to competition now this is what they've done so far on the back of this this slide shows you what jockey has achieved so far so the first chart on top left shows you the sales growth rates historically the earnings growth rates and the returns on capital uh, fairly consistent and healthy the ideal candidate for starting work on a consistent compounders philosophy uh, 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 approach where we want history we want to know why the history is is consistent and and beautiful and hence uh, 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 page is a perfect candidate to be chosen uh, for further work uh, this is what they've also delivered on uh, capital allocation so the two pie charts that you can see show you that source of capital for jockey has been all internal accruals more importantly the deployment of capital right the deployment of capital has included two thirds dividends one third capex right now this is quite important especially if you were doing this pie chart on the right just 3 years ago the capex element would have been 50% uh, more recently they started outsourcing a little and now they are building uh, internal capacities uh, yet again so now capex will increase again over the next 3 or 5 years having a high degree of capex and then maintaining high levels of return on capital is the only way to grow earnings in a sustainable manner over a longer period of time firms that can deliver this globally are the uh, most consistent compounders uh, over longer periods of time 
and hence the combination of great capital allocation and uh, ability to maintain healthy return on capital is uh, is is the best uh, best type of earnings compounding the third chart that you can see is the labor efficiency which i talked about what you can see is the dotted line shows you sales per employee has gone up quite consistently for jockey uh, it's gone up a little faster than um, uh, 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 salaries paid per employee as well and more importantly the volume per employee you can see has also gone up a little especially over the last 3 4 5 years so that's manufacturing efficiency uh, uh, a dividend of uh, in house labor workforce um and this last chart which you can see is a combination of uh, ant spends in absolute terms but more importantly in percentages uh, where i where i mentioned that only 4 4.5% of sales is what uh, what jockey uh, jockey uh, spends on adverts now here are the headwinds that page has faced in the recent past and i'm sure many of you have lots of questions around this to begin with revenue growth has moderated down to 12% yeah volume growth has moderated down to 6% these numbers used to be uh, more than twice this run rate revenue growth used to be more like a 24 25% historically volume growth used to be 14 15% historically so there's been a significant moderation in these growth rates in fy19 yeah uh, van hoysen i'm sure many of you want to ask about that van hoysen has reported a revenue of uh, roughly 200 crores in in a way segment Uh, in FY19 compared to almost nothing in FY18, so they've certainly gained market share. Uh, half of that is in a way, half of that is out of way. Uh, 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 and the third bullet shows that Page has also stopped reporting. So a lot of sell-side brokers and some newspapers also highlighted this after the third quarter results when Page stopped reporting segmental volume and revenue growth rates on a quarterly basis. management's response was that uh, they are at a at a loss from a competitive perspective if they disclose so much of data being the market leader when nobody else discloses their data um, and there's been a few changes in the management team especially the son of the promoter around succession planning etc some some investors might have some concerns around whether this has had any impact on the culture of the senior management team or motivation of the senior management team and is there any linkage between revenue growth moderation and and succession planning at pages uh, uh, pages management uh, why do we continue to hold page despite these headwinds uh, so there is to begin with no market share loss compared to listed incumbents like the ones the names highlighted here and i'll show you a chart on this right after this uh, barring van hoysen no one else has gained market share in uh, in 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 inner wear from page over fy19 uh more importantly when you even come to van hoysen van hoysen has gained only around 5 percentage points worth of page's annual sales so if at all the entire gain for van hoysen is a loss for page we can't substantiate that but if that's the worst case scenario then only about 5 percentage point moderation at best uh from pages revenue growth rate can be attributed to van hoysen uh this is only a quarter of the growth moderation that we've seen or maybe a third of the growth moderation that we've seen and hence not the complete story certainly the second aspect is and this is more the complete story i would say the bulk of the reason for moderation is the industry growth rates itself have got affected because the distribution channel has faced substantial issue because of to begin with gst and now more importantly channel financing in the ongoing nbfc crisis this is not unique to only textile but it is more intense in textile because channel reliance here is a little more uh, you might have heard marico talk about the fact that the entire wholesale channel uh, for them is facing the channel financing issue in the nbfc crisis and hence they are not able to sell despite the demand not being as modest as what their for the manufacturing firm sales uh, sales growth uh, reflects uh, so while the end consumer demand isn't as weak as what sales of the industry suggest uh, it is the channel issue which is leading to the industry being able to sell less than what the end consumer is willing to accept because uh, if uh, if one part of the channel is not willing to comply with gst the other part of the channel doesn't want to sell to the first part right that's one issue 
Uh, and the second issue is uh, that, uh, which is a more recent issue, last six months, uh, lots of these wholesalers who would be involved in, in textile distribution to a certain extent, even page, pages distributors might be selling to wholesalers thereafter. And if anyone in the whole chain is not compliant, then, then the whole chain breaks and the retailer doesn't want to stop those products. And more importantly, uh, the retailers don't want to let the taxman know of the government uh, that that uh, that they are they are uh, doing a business much bigger than what they've historically reported to the government overnight right so that's uh, that's the biggest reason i would say uh, also uh, we've done a lot of checks around uh, uh, the the motivation of uh, management team uh, uh, apparent to industry uh, participants uh, around the way page functions, around software aspects, around IT investments, so on and so forth. We see as of now, we see no reason to be worried about any linkage between any software aspect of page and the moderation in revenue growth rate. Uh, so so that's uh, that's something to put out very clearly as of now. And we, we keep uh, working on these aspects for all the companies that we hold and we cover. Uh, as of now, we don't see any reason for worry uh, and most importantly we are also aware that uh, uh, jockey senior management team is cognizant of uh, the issues faced by the channel in particular uh, cognizant of the the reason why van oisen has been able to grab market share overnight uh, literally by uh, 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 by offering unsustainable unsustainable sort of uh, trade uh, terms um uh, to to their distributors to their uh, uh, retailers uh, 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 by offering products at a far cheaper price than their procurement prices and hence incurring losses uh, which again we believe beyond a point are not sustainable so on and so forth so bearing uh, the the fa bearing in mind the fact that the management is cognizant of this and being aware of a few changes that the management has made to their internal sales team uh, to, uh, to, for instance, uh, the, the channel trade conditions, uh, uh, terms and conditions. Uh, uh, we are uh, at the moment, uh, we are at the moment quite convinced that Page uh, will eventually come out again as a leader in a, in a relatively fast growing industry. Right now, this is a chart which you can see about the growth rate of Jockey vis-a-vis -vis other listed companies so what you can see here is the blue the bluish shade the first shade that you see is page the growth rates have moderated from 36 percent in fy14 to 30 to 16 19 20 12 like that right but none of the listed peers uh, have been able to grow at a pace faster than jockeys in any of the years over the last five years including fy19 so jockey has not seen lower growth rate than any of its listed peers just to put things into context here as i said van hoysen's gain is only four five percent of jockeys annual sales uh, rupa is uh, 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 almost 60 percent of jockeys overall sales uh, lux dollar rupa lovable vip put together along with jockey control more than half of the organized menswear industry right so this is not a very small sample size the listed universe is not a small sample size in the whole organized space. This is actually more than half. So if uh, if here we haven't seen page uh, 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 undergo market share losses, then there is uh, uh, there is some comfort to be had from from the growth rates being the fastest in the industry. Um, this is one chart. I, I mean, this is a slide on valuations. I'm sure many of you would say. Uh, what if the share price correction for page is because of valuation multiples being high rather than uh, rather than anything to do with fundamental weakness? Uh, so the first answer there is this table on top shows you that uh, even historically when pages share price has delivered around 41 percent CAGR out of that 41 percent. This is the last decade, last 10 years out of that 41 percent, 30 percent has come from earnings and only 9, 10 percent has come from from the P by E multiple expansion, right? In a sense, uh, uh, both historically as well as going forward, what we've always maintained is that earnings defines at least 75 to 80% of a share price movement over the longer term. And hence, uh, uh, if 
earnings growth rates going forward remain healthy i think even at this multiple or at the multiple a year ago before the uh, fall in the share price page uh, 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 is a is a is undervalued however if the growth rates going forward and by definition of going forward i would say next 10 15 20 years if page cannot grow at a 15% 20% or higher cagr then a uh, 50 51 times p multiple even today is very very expensive right so the call is all on earnings valuation multiples uh, beyond a point are not compounding factors compounding happens only via earnings and hence as long as earnings are all right and that's what our call is here valuations are relatively less significant uh and this is one last uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, chart to be seen where we've shown that in uh, between the middle of 2015 and early 2016 we saw 40% correction in pages share price again there was a disappointment or a moderation in earnings growth rates at that time yeah uh, so this is not the first time that pages share price has corrected it has happened in the past the moderation was obviously from mid 20s to mid teens uh, but that uh, once once the fundamentals did reverse you can see what happened to the share price thereafter now what we are not saying is that history will repeat itself but all we are saying is that that page has seen such uh, such volatility in the share price uh, other expensive stocks like bajaj finance like uh, uh, some of the other richly valued uh, uh, companies richly valued not overvalued yeah companies they do tend to have volatility in their share prices basis uh, is a little bit of moderation in in their in their fundamentals so that's uh, that's where i would end uh, uh, very quickly this actually is a chart showing how first quarter fy20 has gone by uh, the dotted lines are 15% run rates so horizontal axis has got revenue growth yoy for 1q vertical axis has got earnings growth yoy for 1q and the bottom left quadrant is the slow growth top right is uh, uh, is the fast growth uh, area Uh, and you can see barring only two stocks and you can guess which two stocks those are very easily and page being uh, 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 no page hasn't reported yet sorry so page is not part of this chart so barring two stocks uh, all the other 11 stocks in our portfolio uh, have uh, have have all the other 10 stocks in our portfolio have had a very phenomenal growth rate even over the last quarter right so here i would end um, and if there's uh, Uh, yeah. yeah. So plenty of questions. First, I think let's uh, go in the order of uh, page itself. Let's let's address the questions relevant to page, and then we'll come to general philosophy, and then we'll come to some macro questions. Um, Rakshit, there's a question on uh, mature companies. Given most of uh, our portfolio companies are large and have been in existence for a long time. uh um, the question goes that don't you think that the market for these companies is saturated which is what is reflecting in page um how do you uh, you know how 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 do you manage or manage to forecast growth for such mature companies for long periods of time well into the future sure so i'll give you uh, uh a very broad way of looking at this and this will uh, this will probably open up the thought process a little better so uh what is the challenge the challenge is someone like relaxo yeah it manufactures uh, 17 18 crores footwear pairs every year imagine yeah uh, india's population is 100 125 crores and here we've got a company selling selling 20 crores pairs a year and it has then put up capacity to uh, uh, sort of expand expand this run rate uh, going forward and it is even continuing to grow volumes right uh you got page uh, delivering page has now got 10 crore 10 crore men's innerwear volume sales each year yeah on top of it then you got in total around 18 19 crores uh, uh manufactured and sold by page each year right so these numbers are big when you compare them against hanes when you compare them against let's say a uh, 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 flip flop company based in uh, based in the us these numbers will look very close to saturation and hence the apprehension is justified the question is justified but just look at it like this <clears throat> so uh, page is operating in let's talk about category sizes so page's revenues are 3000 crores as of now yeah uh, the category of innerwear in india is 40000 crore for 
men plus women yeah category of uh, leisure wear we've not got a, 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 a big uh, a consultant publishing a paper on this but i would won't be surprised if category of leisure wear in india is anything uh, more than 30 40 50000 crores in size now this leisure wear includes t-shirts uh, track pants socks thermals uh, uh, yeah so so on and so forth now by the way we haven't added to this uh, kids wear uh, which is at least half the size of uh, uh, men's and women's in a wear right so if you add all these category sizes together page is 3000 crores in a 1 lakh crore category today yeah that's the starting point so it's a drop in the ocean very similar to putting it like this uh, 6 lakh crore of loan book growth of hdfc bank is huge but it is only 6% of credit for india yeah now that's the starting point the next point is you've got uh, 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 unorganized to organized shifts happening right and page relaxo HDFC Bank, they are all organized product providers, right? The Sahukar industry of lenders moving to uh, white lending itself. I mean, uh, Sahukar is the unorganized lender in the gown, right? That itself is a huge potential, right? That shift. And if HDFC Bank can be uh, the bigger market share, if Page can be bigger market share, that shift itself is huge, right? So to begin with, Page is very small. Uh, in the in the broader industry by value. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, you've got a huge potential of uh, 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 volume growth rate for the organized within the overall industry. And then Page uh, can gain market share significantly from its peers. Uh, and if that happens, then I don't think we are anywhere close to being saturated. Another way just to sort of uh, highlight the freakiness. When Asian Paints went public in 1983, they already had 50% market share. They still have 50% market share. Asian Paints is up 1700x since 1983. So 28% compounded. ITC pretty much every decade for the last three decades has given 10x in 10 years. 26% uh, compounded. ITC uh, for the last 80 years has had 80% market share. Um, when Marico went public in 95, it had already had 50% market share in, in cooking oil. Marico is up to 70x since uh, since IPO. So even if your market share is 50%, 60%, we're looking at very high market shares. Now all you do is sustain the high level of market share. You still give 26% compounded if you dominate the category. Why does that happen? Because top line, which is what market share in effect uh, uh, represents, is only part of the story, right? Um, you, you've got the underlying market growing. Then you've got operating efficiency, then you've got working capital efficiencies, and then you've got the ability of a high class company to return money through dividends and buybacks. So don't get lost and worried about uh, this issue of saturation. I'll give you a Western market example. I think McDonald's opened the th thousandth, thousandth McDonald's in, in USA in 1987. A lot of people said, oh, yeah, I done. Uh, the stock is up for a Western market country. The stock since 87 to now is up, I think, 20, 25 X, which is unbelievable for a company which in 87 and opened the thousand McDonald's. So they never get lost in this nonsense about saturation. If Asian Paints wasn't, wasn't saturated 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, ITC wasn't saturated 40, 30, 20, 10 years ago, uh, it's highly unlikely that Page or HDFC Bank uh, is saturated at, at this level. Okay, there's one related. If we are so convinced about pages uh, more, why won't we add to our exposure in page? So, uh, look, I mean, uh, we already have, uh, if you're a client, you know the exposure, it's double digits. Uh, uh, do we want to have a single stock as 25, 30% of the portfolio? Uh, well, as long as we can find six, seven, eight, nine such great companies, which all of them can have nearly 10%, 12% allocation each. That's a better way to diversify uh, rather than uh, putting all eggs in the same basket where in one year you are shooting through the roof and then you're delivering volatility. Again, uh, delivering uh, a healthy compounding of return is not enough. Delivering that with low volatility is very critical. To a large extent, the low volatility is provided to our portfolio by the by the uh, uh, moat of the company 
and hence the defensive aspect of their business. Uh, but to a certain extent, we cannot uh, then say that we'll just buy Asian Paints and that's it. Uh, we'll not buy any other company in the portfolio. Okay. <laughs> Related to that, but uh, on the other direction is if let's say our research had suggested that indeed the textile distribution industry is going through a downturn because of the changes in GST, demonetization and so on. Shouldn't we have exited page, sat out the downturn and revisited when things would have normalized? So theoretically, we should have, we could have, we uh, uh, should keep doing that in future. But that's only theory. In practice, we cannot time these things. Just just think about it like this. Uh, uh, the the NBFC crisis has, has just started uh, uh, six, seven, eight months ago, right? Uh, We've been talking about it. Saurabh has been talking about it on TV. Uh, I've been talking about it on TV that we don't see the ground level situation being very good. Right. We all know that uh, 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 even an HDFC bank or a Bajaj finance will undergo moderation because they'll become a little cautious when uh, uh, credit condi the liquidity conditions and then even asset quality deteriorates uh, 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 significantly. They will become cautious. Uh, one way is to time this and uh, exit sit on cash uh, from these positions and the other way is to say that i don't know how deep or how shallow this will be all i know is that whenever this goes through you will actually have a significant market share gain uh, uh, and hence uh, there's no point timing these things uh, uh, otherwise uh, it becomes a very risky affair to manage money okay one last question on page um, given India's lack of competitiveness in textiles and we've seen enough market share loss to economies like Bangladesh and Vietnam, um, how does this expose or benefit? How does this impact page uh, in particular? Yeah. So, see, this is a real threat uh, in the sense that uh, uh, manufacturing costs per unit labor in India are going up and uh, I think one of our clients uh, sent us an email a couple of days back uh, asking the same question and requesting to be answered, uh, uh, requesting it to be answered in the webinar. Uh, so look, uh, just by going on the cost metrics, it would perhaps make sense for some of the manufacturers, maybe even Page, to go for outsourced manufacturing that to outside of India, right? But the challenge there is if you are delivering differentiated product, outsourcing manufacturing will kill the differentiation right especially just think about it like this uh, uh, the the kids where that page is manufacturing this is page's own third attempt at doing kids were in the last decade right they have got it right only after a third attempt in kids where there is no competitor other than body care right body care is the only product that i see at least in bombay and delhi where i've bought stuff for my kids you don't see any organized brand available out there H hence if you just uh, go for outsource manufacturing at best you'll get what body care is also delivering i don't know if body care's manufacturing is outsourced or in house but there isn't a large enough trained labor workforce delivering to a manufacturer what he wants to deliver to a customer and hence product differentiation with outsource manufacturing in textile is uh, is not possible what jockey already does by the way is it buys the yarn and wherever value addition is uh, zero or negligible uh, uh, jockey outsources the knitting uh, the weaving etc and it's only the cutting the sewing part which it does in house so uh, so i don't think it will work on differentiated product okay um you know happy to take further questions on page by email or or by telephone uh, right now we'll just move on to some of the other aspects I, th I think it is quite natural. People have moved on to the second uh, negative bar in that chart, uh, Rakshit. So people want to know uh, ITC. Uh, why is ITC down? In fact, one specific question, they reckon ITC's uh, capital allocation track record hasn't been particularly stellar. I guess they're referring to the investments in hotels and stuff. Yeah. So can we take ITC as a whole? Sure. So uh, see, to begin with on capital allocation, so ITC has deployed uh, uh, so 60% of the last 15 years of operating cash flow has been returned as dividends. Yeah. Uh, out of the balance, 40% only a tenth, which is 4% of overall operating cash flow. Only a tenth has gone into hotels. Yeah. So uh, I do agree 
that hotels has been capital misallocation because returns on capital there have been uh, subpar, especially less than 10%, right? So uh, it's 4% of the operating cash flow which gets allocated uh, uh, allocated or a tenth of the capex which gets allocated in, in suboptimal manner. The remaining nine-tenth of uh, capex or 96% of operating cash flow it has been delivering an average return on capital of 60-65%. The lowest in that is paper agri, which delivers around 25-27%. Now remember, some of the paper agri is actually commodity, not even B2C, despite that they're delivering 25-27% in those two verticals. Uh, the, the highest, obviously, is cigarettes, which is more than 100%. And, uh, and you've got now the non-cigarette FMCG also ramping up very nicely. Uh, uh, even this quarter, they reported some 50% YOY growth, if I'm correct, uh, in earnings for the non-cigarette FMCG. The margins are expanding there and very soon you'll have overall return on capital far exceeding 15% uh, for for ITC. So capital misallocation is not so a one thing to realize, folks, is what, what ITC very cleverly does in its public portrayal. ITC in its public portrayal deliberately underplays how monstrous a cash generator it is right remember this is a company which wants to portray itself as not making tons of money but the reality is this is an unparalleled cash generator in india as rakshit said those hotels barely make uh, an roc of what even 10 like 9 not 10 percent right imagine this is a company which is financing these mammoth hotels uh with barely four percent of its operating cash flow and you and i see them in every city right many of us i'm sure visit them as well it barely takes four percent of their operating cash flows and the rest of its capital allocation it is chugging out tons of cash it deliberately underplays that in the public domain to create this perception that hey it's all all is not good life is not so easy uh, obviously in its core cigarette business which is uh, what 80 percent of profits right core cigarette business its ROCs will be well in excess, well in excess of 110, 120%. So astonishing cash machine. Don't get caught up in the negative publicity. And for Christ's sake, don't even think about selling those shares. Uh, a monopoly player has been for 100 years, 80, 85% market share in an addictive product with the world's youngest demographic, with the government announcing last year an FDI ban on cigarettes, which means for the rest of your and my lifetime, this company will have a cash machine without uh, equal. Don't get caught up in the negative publicity. Uh, just to quantify revenue growth, earnings growth, uh, expectation, what has happened over the last five, six years. Uh, so last five years in particular, especially 2013 to 16, those four budgets have had around 20% average annual increase in excise duties on, uh, on cigarettes. Uh, it is a well-known fact, and uh, we've written about it uh, in our in our publications when you, we used to be sell-side analysts. Uh, that uh, no matter whether you look at India or abroad, uh, around eight to ten percent average annual price hike has no price elasticity of demand, right? But above 10, 12, 13 percent average annual price hike has a very high degree of price elasticity of demand in the short term. That's also short term point to be noted. Now, uh, when for four consecutive years, and this is not the first time that it is, this has happened to cigarettes. Uh, uh, this happened in the early noughties as well. Early noughties, cigarettes saw for four consecutive years. Very penal and volume growth rates became negative at that time. Uh, because what IDC always does is whatever is the excise hike, it passes it on to the customer. And customer, when, it, when the customer is thrown up with 20% uh, price hike, YOY, he uh, reduces consumption uh, in the interim. Eventually, that consumption comes back in, and hence the moment you see the pressure on on taxation uh, get re relieve, uh, ITC's uh, ITC's volume growth rate comes back into the positive territory. Just to put things into context, this quarter they've reported some three four percent volume growth, which is actually uh, the long term run rate that we expect ITC to deliver, and on top. 10% price hike, so 13, 14% or 12, 13% uh, uh, cigarette EBIT, EBIT growth or revenue growth is what we expect. Uh, last quarter, they delivered 8% volume growth, right? This is because last 18 months, you've not seen penal taxation in cigarettes. So uh, uh, we will see, we will see a reversal of what you saw between FY13 and FY17, where ITC could grow uh, earnings in single digit. Uh, and revenues in single digit because volume growth of cigarettes was minus five, minus six uh, percent. So that's what that was a temporary affair. 
going forward, we expect it to reverse, uh, and hence we continue to hold. Okay, so so we can move to the more positive uh, parts of the portfolio, and I guess we've moved to the complete extreme uh, and the outlier that's uh, Bajaj Finance. Plenty of questions around that. Um, a lot of questions around uh, how long do you think Bajaj Finance can sustain uh, this sort of growth? Uh, related to that is if you're so convinced about it, clearly it's an outlier. Why don't you increase the weight of Bajaj Finance in our portfolio? And if you don't increase the weight, the sheer you know, difference in the performance would mean that at some stage Bajaj Finance could be, say, 25% of our portfolio. In that case, would we start paring down um, are holding in Bajaj Finance. Sure. So uh, to begin with, let me quickly sum up our journey of conviction on Bajaj Finance. So honestly speaking, till three, four years ago, uh, 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 we were not very convinced on the sustainability of the mode here. Right. Uh, that is perhaps also because our work till then had not got so deep. Uh, that is also because uh, Bajaj Finance three, four years ago, had not faced too many ups and downs in the external environment. It had not challenged itself by expanding into uh, uncharted territories a lot, especially till 2013. It had done only consumer durables largely. Right. So uh, uh, we Bajaj Finance hadn't been tested enough and we hadn't uh, uh, built our conviction deep enough till three, four, five years ago. Uh, that journey has got to a stage where today we are convinced at least on the on the sustenance of its uh, of its mode for the next say decade or so. Uh, the growth run rate obviously is uh, is very high at the moment uh, and it, it should remain uh, uh, certainly not 50, 60 percent over the next decade, but it should certainly remain higher than I would say 20, 25 percent over the next decade. And as long as that growth run rate is there. It will be one of the faster growing, growing, uh, uh, faster growing earnings uh, run rates in our in our portfolio. Now, it's not the lowest allocation. It's somewhere in the middle. You would know where it is. Uh, uh, the comparison with, let's say, an HDFC bank, which is higher allocation in the financial space versus Bajaj Finance. An HDFC bank has demonstrated uh, in far greater degree uh, uh, the ability to manage uh, uh, extreme volatility in the external environment, uh, uh, management teams transition well, not beyond, not Aditya Puri, but uh, certainly as a firm scales up, uh, the empowerment of professionals has to happen a lot more. Uh, the history is much longer for us to analyze and get convinced about, uh, 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 so on and so forth. So to that extent, uh, uh, we do have a little higher conviction on HDFC Bank, uh, uh, where again, we are not expecting HDFC Bank to deliver earnings growth, which ITC is likely to deliver. It's much higher than that in terms of our expectation. Uh, one of the highest, again, I would say. Uh, uh, so, so that's the reason why there's a little bit of difference. If Bajaj Finance becomes 25% of our portfolio, certainly we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll consider uh, uh, at that time how uh, sustainable we believe the moat is. If we have an iota of doubt, uh, which in many cases is highly likely. We will probably trim it down. So uh, as of now, we've uh, we've not had that situation. When it happens, we most likely will not uh, put all our eggs in one or two stocks, as in put all our uh, uh, investments in one or two stocks by having two stocks of 25% each. So we will uh, pare down the pare down the allocations a bit, uh, but it will remain a concentrated portfolio. And Bajaj Finance, if it keeps delivering, will be one of the higher allocations. Okay, so one last stock specific question. This is on Asian Paints, the other uh, top performer in the portfolio. The question is, we're in the middle of uh, perhaps India's worst downturn downturn in real estate. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, what everybody now agrees is a massive consumer slowdown. Yet Asian Paints is delivering the sort of growth it's delivering and it's reflecting in the stock's performance. Uh, can you explain to our readers what, what drives Asian Paints growth? Right. So a very, very relevant question, I would say. So if you want to understand it in one line and then I'll maybe add five more lines uh, in one line. To the extent that the pain faced by most consumer manufacturers, consumer products manufacturers is related to the channel. Right. To the extent that it is related to the channel and channel pain is whatever GST, demonetization, uh, NBFC crisis, so on and so forth. Asian paints doesn't have a channel. Right. It sells directly to the end retailer that to the end retailer sits on a couple of hours of inventory. 
right? So the, the any working capital issues faced by the end retailer, which is the paint dealer on the high street, right, uh, uh, last for a couple of hours, right? So to that extent, Asian paints obviously doesn't get affected, affected by uh, uh, by 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 channel issues. Uh, that's one part. As a result, to a large extent, and this is not common to only Asian paints. Remember. Berger has also reported, reported the same growth rate. So there's something common to paints in general. The common thing, the only common thing is uh, there's no channel here. And that's one. The second thing, if you look at the retailers, so just think about it like this. Compare Unilever versus Dmart. Right? Now, I'm not saying I'm a fan of either Unilever or Dmart. But, uh, but if you compare Unilever versus Dmart in terms of their growth rates, Right, Dmart hasn't reported the kind of moderation in growth rates that Unilever has. Although Dmart sells the products which Unilever manufactures, manufactures, right? Because Dmart doesn't rely on the channel to sell, right? Whereas Unilever relies on the channel to sell. Right? That's again a data point that you can have in your mind. So uh, joining all these data points, in all likelihood, a large part of consumption moderation that we've seen so far is channel issue, right? Wherever you see more wholesale. Within FMCG, more wholesale oriented companies are worst affected. Direct distribution related are less affected. Uh, retail direct to uh, end consumer are least affected. Right. So that probably. Explains. I think uh, undergarments is the classic example. I don't think any of us can logically say suddenly Indians are changing their undergarments. Uh, but they are painting the walls. <laughs> <laughs> change in, they become un- un- Indians have become un- unhygienic. They are changing the undergarments less often. And yet we are seeing, as Rakshit showed you, on that chart on page, dollar, rupa, all of them, their growth has stopped, conked off. And it can't be that there's been a structural shift in undergarment demand. What's happened is channel is packed up and hence why, hence all of these companies have, have slowed down. Since page was growing so much faster, the slowdown feels more acute for it. Yeah. So one on the portfolio, I think, uh, is a generic and I think the, the listener in particular asking this question is appreciative of the fact that the portfolio is held up. But having said that, given your macro view, sort of given the sort of uh, headwinds that we're going to face, mm. um, clearly the markets are going to correct a lot more. In the, in the face of it, um, how much will consistent compounders be able to hold up? Yeah. Um, if yes, what sort of drawdowns are we looking at? And how long does the recovery happen? So, um, so I think super question. And I think we'll refer to uh, the book. Uh, we'll refer to this book. Uh, uh, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's easy to buy, easy to read. So there is an appendix in the book, which uh, appendix four, which deals with exactly this question about, in fact, the, the, the appendix four is called how CCPs, how coffee can portfolios outperform during, during market stress. So read appendix four. What we have done in Appendix 4 is taken the last 25 years of data and shown what happens in market stress. So, so if you uh, if you if you have the book, you can open to pages 269 onwards. Uh, if you don't buy it and, and read it, because it will help you understand this point. Basically, what happens in our country is, in the last 25 years, in around 40% of the years, so that's 10 years out of 25, the markets given negative returns, right? So, markets given negative return in 10 years, positive returns in, in 15 years, right? If you take uh, a stock like Asian Paints and there's charts pretty much for all our portfolio stocks, there's charts in that book. You can refer to that. Asian Paints has given negative returns in four out of 25 years. Ditto for HDFC Bank, for instance, right? Rather than markets given negative returns in 10, Asian Paints or HDFC Bank have given negative returns in four. Now, what are the four years where Asian Paints has given negative returns? FY 2009, that's the Lehman crisis. FY 97, the East Asian crisis. FI99, the dot com bust, and FI01, 911, Kitten Parik scam, whichever way you want to look at it, right? So if the market melts down, if you have a you know, big meltdown in the country, uh, Asian Paints has, has had negative years, 4 out of 25. But what's interesting, and if you uh, read Appendix 4 of Coffee Can Investing, you'll see those in those years that Asian Paints corrected, it corrected anywhere between 0 to 20 percent, it typically correct, fell half of what the market fell. So the market falls, say, 40 percent, Asian paints falls 20 percent, the market falls 20 percent, Asian paints falls 10 percent, right? Even more interestingly, what the chart shows, every subsequent year, subsequent year, Asian paints goes up more than 30 percent. 
almost every instance of Asian paint falling. So FI 2001, FI 01, Asian paints fell around 6-7%. FI 02, it rose more than 30%. FI 99, Asian paints fell around 15%. FI 00, Asian paints rose about 30%. So Asian paints falls. It's a stock. It's not a bond. There is no assurance that you'll get make money every year. It's corrected 4 out of 25 years. Uh, markets corrected 10 out of 25 years. When it corrects, it corrects half as much as the market. And the subsequent year, it roars back. Why does that happen? Why does it roar back in a correction? Why does an HDFC bank roar back in a correction? The answer is simple. Pretty much everything in our portfolio are essential products, right? Whether it's Marico, whether it's ITC, whether it's Page, whether it's Asian Paints. We are buying stuff. We are investing in things which are essential products. So it doesn't matter what's happening in the stock market. People are buying cooking oil. They're buying cigarettes. They're buying undergarments they're buying chappals etc so even though there's a stock market pullback as is evidenced in the last couple of months and as we were discussing i think probably likely to continue even though there's a stock market pullback the earnings compounding of our companies is continuing unabated so if these stocks start pulling back and even though we're making money even we have fallen a couple of percent in, in july the p multiples of our stocks are coming off and then at the first sign of recovery in confidence, these stocks, these portfolios that this portfolio that you are holding, the listeners on this call, this portfolio will roar back fastest in a recovery because of the essential nature of the product. No, nobody in the right mind who wants to come back and invest in India, the foreign investors, for instance, when they come back to India, they will say we want to invest in companies which are well run high quality selling an essential product and with a monopoly stuff like itc stuff like asian paint stuff like page stuff like uh, 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 marico this will roar up the fastest in recovery so you get downside protection and you get upside exposure the downside protection is what we showed you on the first slide when rakshit began the presentation the upside exposure is what we hope to show you uh, over the next uh, you know 12, one to two years so specifically, people want to know what sort of a meltdown is this? Is this akin to the Ketan Parekh? Is this akin to the dot-com bust or the Asian crisis or the global financial crisis? Net-net, what they want to understand is how deep can the drawdown for CCP be if they were to put money today? So, so one way to think about it is um, if uh, let's think of earnings growth, right? Earnings growth for our portfolio stocks are still running at around 15 to 20 percent. So 18, 19 percent is earnings growth for our portfolio stocks. Assume that the economy completely craters, right? Say a private, the, as, as we were discussing earlier on, a private bank goes bust, a couple of NBFCs, HFCs go bust. If that happens, then earnings growth for our portfolio stocks could well slow down to to 9-10% rather than the 18-19% that these portfolio stocks are showing in in the in the current quarter. So you take off earnings growth and you say that the P multiple pulls back by a quarter. If the earnings growth slows down, the P multiple pulls back by a quarter. You could see anywhere between a zero to minus ten situation in an economic you know economic meltdown. Economic meltdown being wide scale financial crisis. The core of this crisis is around the is around the beleaguered beleaguered DFSI sector. Our PSU banks you know, are smashed, as we all know, we've seen them you know, in front of you or in my eyes. The PSU sector has been dismantled. And as we've been saying for two years, on, from, we've been shouting from the rooftops for two years, the NBFC sector is a wreck. NBFC housing finance is a wreck in our country. So probably in the climactic stages of this financial services sector blowing up, uh, if you ask me, the sooner it blows up, the better. The longer this nonsense continues, of you know uh, complete rubbish balance sheets being published fictitious credit ratings being published uh, the longer it continues the more the channel finance issues rakshit highlighted will persist so in a way for all our benefits i think if we have a you know next three months we get this nonsense out of the system it'd be brilliant to be fair to the powers that be in delhi and in mint road i think they're trying to do that they're trying to make sure that you don't save the people who have been bullshitting with their numbers for the last four or five years, publishing fictitious balance sheets for all these years. They're trying to make sure they don't get saved needlessly. At the same time, they're trying to ensure a soft landing for the system. So in a worst case situation where earnings growth for our portfolio companies halves to 9-10% and we have a PE pullback of 25 odd percent, I think even in that scenario, you're looking at 0 to minus 10 uh, and potentially for the market, you're looking at minus 20. Thank you.
So for some reason, a lot of people are asking us about HDFC Limited. Just to clarify, we don't own HDFC Limited in the portfolio, nor do we have any intention to own. We do own HDFC Bank, right? Um, there's one question on uh, TCS sort of somebody's referring to your appearance on the media uh, that we own TCS um, some in, of some the, of our clients. in yeah. some of the clients portfolios. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so there's two places, folks, where we own TCS. We don't own it in the CCP. Uh, we uh, we are advisors to an offshore fund, uh, which is also called Consistent Compounders. Uh, that offshore fund is offered by, um, you know, we live in India, so we're not fund managers to that offshore fund. Um, uh, Indian rules don't allow us to be actually. So the offshore fund is man offered under the auspices of Kotak Asset Management. Because Kotak Asset Management offers the fund, we can't own Kotak Bank in that offshore fund. So so rather than Kotak Bank, we've got these in that in that offshore fund. Um, um, so that's that's the genesis of ownership of TCS. Uh, we offer the portfolio that you guys on the call have. Uh, uh, people overseas also have the portfolio. The only difference is other than Kotak Bank, it's TCS. The reason is Kotak Asset Management is the fund manager of our offshore fund. We are advisors to that fund uh, under legal constructs. And since Kotak Asset Management can't own Kotak Bank, we own TCS there. Rachid, there are several people asking about how do we go about uh, sizing the portfolio, sizing your positions in the portfolio. Sure. So uh, there are two factors to keep it simple. One, uh, the conviction on sustenance of the moat, right? Uh, and the second one is the run rate of compounding expected. So uh, just to give you an example. Um, so our conviction of sustenance, conviction on sustenance of the moat on a Marico is, uh, uh, is, is, or an ITC, is as good as it is in the case of let's say uh, 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 a Nestle, right? But uh, we expect Nestle, especially because of the category growth rate, we expect Nestle to compound at a higher run rate than Marico and ITC. And as a result, uh, we have higher allocation to Nestle than to ITC and Marico. So, so one is the compounding run rate expected, and second is uh, uh, the, the 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 degree of conviction. Yeah, I think with that, we've uh, answered most of the questions. There are some uh, you know, minor questions which are specific. We'll try and uh, put out uh, an FAQ of sorts so that uh, everybody can access those rather than uh, answering them uh, on this platform. But uh, nonetheless, uh, feel free to write to us, um, call up our, uh, uh, our numbers if you have any further questions on your particular portfolio uh, or anything. And uh, like Saurabh said, uh, the, the consulting uh, consultation paper on the PMS uh, reforms are uh, are out there. Uh, one question, Saurabh, is about how long will the SEBI give in terms of the consult the, the, the recommendations coming to reality? So, look, I mean, what we know for sure is 30th August is the deadline for people to uh, you know give inputs to the regulator. Um, what timeline the regulator uh, will take thereafter you know, is really not, not something I can I can comment on. That's the regulator's prerogative. But given the amount of work uh, uh, the working group put to be put in over the last uh, six seven months, over six seven months of very intense work to 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 come up with uh, a new construct for PMS, hopefully a, a better construct for the PMS industry. Given the amount of work we put in and the regulator put in. Uh, I can't imagine they'll just sit on it for months on an end. So 30th August is the deadline for submissions um, to the regulator. My reckoning is you know, the regulator will be relatively prompt, but I, I, I'm really in no position to give dates. Thanks, Saurabh. Thanks, Rakshit. Um, thanks, Thank everyone, thanks. for coming in. And like I said, please uh, feel free to write in if you have any additional questions. We'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you.